Welcome to Big Tent Live Events, our new lockdown live online event series from the University of Oxford as part of the Humanities Cultural Programme, one of the founding stones for the future Stephen A. Schwartzman Centre for the Humanities. My name is Wes Williams and I'm Professor of French Literature here at Oxford and I'm also the Knowledge Exchange Champion at TORCH, the Oxford Research Centre for the Humanities. The Big Tent Live Event Series is our way of bringing together once a week researchers and students, performers and practitioners from across the humanities disciplines and indeed from across the world. We will explore important subjects and ask challenging questions about areas such as the environment, medical humanities, ethics and AI, the public, the private and the common good. And we will celebrate storytelling, music, performance and identity and also community. We are bringing you this event program online to complement social distancing with creative community connection. We hope that you're all safe and well during this difficult time. Everyone is welcome in our big tent, so please make yourself metaphorically as well as literally at home this evening as we explore the work, the legacy and the questions raised by one of classical music's most popular but also enigmatic figures whose birthday it happens to be today. Today, 7th of May, marks the 180th anniversary of the birth of Pyotr Ilyich Tchaikovsky, Russia's most famous 19th century composer, and as I mentioned, one of the most popular classical composers of all places and all times. To discuss Tchaikovsky's life and work, we have with us two experts in the field, Leah Broad and Philip Bullock. I'll embarrass them both by saying a little more about them, their work, and why we thought it would be good to bring them together this evening before we start. But before that, I'd like to remind you that if you would like to put forward any questions to our speakers during the event tonight, please pop them in the comments box on YouTube. We encourage you to submit these early as possible so that we have time to answer as many as possible in the Q&A, which will follow this initial discussion. In other words, in about half an hour. Now, on to our excellent speakers tonight. It's an honour to host and to welcome Dr. Leah Broad and Professor Philip Bullock. Leah Broad is a junior research fellow at Christchurch University of Oxford and a BBC AHRC New Generation thinker. She specialises in Nordic and British 20th century music and has publications in Music and Letters, Journal of the Royal Musical Association, Tempo, Music and the Moving Image and 19th Century Music Review. Philip Bullock is Professor of Russian Literature and Music at the University of Oxford and Fellow and Tutor in Russian at Wadham College. He's also the current Director of Torch and in that role you will have seen him playing the role that I'm playing today. His publications include a study of the Russian author Andrei Platonov and two works focused on the traveller, polyglot, poet and inspirational friend of some of Europe's leading musicians from Elgar through to Sibelius and Janacek, namely Rosa Newmarch. First, Rosa Newmarch and Russian music in late 19th and early 20th century England, and then the correspondence of Jean Sevelius and Rosa Newmarch, 1906 to 1939. Philip's most recent study, published in the Critical Live series from Reaction Books, is the biography, Pyotr Tchaikovsky. I think it's clear why we've asked them to come together today to talk. And this evening, Leah and Philip will trace how Tchaikovsky became such a revered figure ask what it means to, uh, to think of him as a Russian uh, composer and more broadly to think about nationalism in music and explore the challenges of writing musical lives, musical biography. So I'll now disappear for your screens for a good while and hand over to Leah to begin the in conversation. Over to you, Leah, thank you. Thanks, Wes. Thank you. And uh, hi, Philip. It's uh, really good to sort of be with you virtually to uh, have this conversation to celebrate Tchaikovsky's birthday. So, you know, let's start out with the sort of the broad brushstrokes. Tchaikovsky is, as well as mentioned, one of the most popular classical composers around. His pieces are very widely known. He'll always be making it into the Classic FM Hall of Fame. So how is it that Tchaikovsky became really the most famous Russian composer of his day? Well, it's a really good question uh, because it, really he shouldn't have become a composer at all when he was born in 1840. There was no such profession available in the Russian Empire. There was plenty of music making. There were aristocrats and gentry, uh, gentry families who made music in their houses, in the capitals and in the countryside. And there's plenty of folk music. But you couldn't train to be a composer. There weren't any schools or conservatories. 
And so Tchaikovsky had a, a wonderful home education. He grew up speaking French as well as Russian and was destined for a career in the imperial administration. And so he goes off to the School of Jurisprudence in Petersburg to train to be a lawyer. And you might be wondering what changed. Well, 1859 changed and the establishment of the Russian Musical Society, which began to put musical life in Russia on a more professional footing. And along with that came conservatories first in Petersburg and then in Moscow. And Tchaikovsky went off to study at the St. Petersburg Conservatory. He graduated from it in his first cohort and then went off to become professor at the Moscow Conservatory. And thereafter, he is the central figure in Russian musical life. He teaches at the Moscow Conservatory, as I've said, uh, until 1877. Thereafter, he has an important administrative role in lots of the key uh, state institutions when it comes to music making. And he becomes Russia's court composer. He has a very close relationship with the Romanov dynasty. He enjoys an imperial pension from 1884, I think. And he gets commissions for the Mariinsky Theater and his works are staged in all of the leading ballet and opera houses. And so he comes to represent Russia musically at, at the time until his death in 1893. And indeed, after that, his funeral in 1893 was along with Tolstoy's funeral in 1910 the biggest public event in the Russian Empire, witnessed by many, and he was mourned by the whole, by the whole nation at the time. And so that's that's really this extraordinary story from a country with no formal musical institutions to one where music was absolutely central, and he was the the, the, the figurehead. A little bit, perhaps, like some of the stories which uh, shape Sibelius, the, the composer whom you've worked on, and someone who becomes the musical embodiment of his nation at a really key point in its development. Yeah, it must have been quite surreal to be kind of lionized in that way during their own lifetimes because that's not really something that happens to an awful lot of composers but to achieve that level of fame um and certainly you know knowing that everything you write might one day be combed over by somebody like us um must be a <laughs> quite strange feeling i think to always be under that kind of level of public scrutiny really even you know <laughs> during his own lifetime Yes, and Tchaikovsky was actually rather a shy person and, and, and didn't like the fame and, and didn't really like the social obligations that came with his public role. He was very proud, very patriotic, very keen to be the musical symbol of Imperial Russia, but he didn't like the consequences of that. And he left us about 6,000 letters and they're very extraordinary, rich, very literate documents. Uh, and he was always aware that these would be read later. And I think he carefully constructed his persona both in his own life and certainly with an eye to posterity. So how how would you describe Tchaikovsky's personality? Just just you know a little a little flavour of who he was as a person. Gosh, I mean he 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 can be very funny, uh, very bawdy at times. The recent publication of his letters to his publisher contains a vast amount of of uh, a profanity, which I think is a shock to quite a lot of us. Um, he was very literate. In fact, uh, when he was a young man, it was really thought he might have a a literary career uh, rather than a musical one. He wrote poetry in French and Russian. He's a, he's a very, very um, fluent writer who's capable of giving uh, great detail to uh, his personal experiences uh, and to describe his inner emotions. Uh, he, he was very naturally at home in the word. He read George Eliot, he read Dickens, he read Tolstoy and Dostoevsky and Turgenev. He, he, he was a very fluent person. Uh, we also know he was a, a very loyal friend to, to his, his close friends and capable of great personal intimacy. Um, we also know, of course, that his private life, we may come onto that in, in due course, was something that, that did give him some anxiety and we can we can trace that. And he was also a, a beloved uncle uh, in his family to his nieces and nephews and a, a very loyal sibling to his a number of siblings. And uh, the letters throw a great deal of light on actually the domestic life of the Russian gentry in the, in the 19th century and are, are useful from that point of view as well. So he's got these influences coming from all over the place, right? Because you mentioned Dickens, Eliot, Tolstoy, French writers as well. But he is very much as thought of as a Russian composer. So what does it kind of mean to call Tchaikovsky a Russian composer? Because that comes with an awful lot of connotations of baggage around nationalism um, and how that sort of manifests itself in music. You're quite, you're quite right. He was certainly proud to call himself a Russian composer and felt that he embodied the Russian people, the Russian states, uh, often the Russian empire as well. His close relationship with the imperial family meant that he was very aware of how his music could serve the course of, of Russian culture, both within the Russian empire itself and, and internationally, because alongside his renown within Russia, he was a, f a, fame, a famous figure in, in Europe and North America in his own lifetime. Um, so 
for sure, a Russian composer, but I think uh, he was also very skeptical about being a nationalist in many ways. Um, he trained at the Petersburg Conservatory. His teacher was Anton Rubinstein, who believed absolutely in the supremacy of the Austro-German symphonic tradition. And Tchaikovsky inherited many of those assumptions as well. Look at the works he wrote. He wrote symphonies, string quartets, piano sonatas, uh, concertos. He worked in the mainstream Western European forms that had been sort of refined over the 18th and early 19th century and aligned himself very much with that school. Um, so it's important to see him as Russian, but in dialogue with European traditions. He adored Bizet's music. He adored Mozart's. He uh, was rather skeptical about Wagner, but he was always up to date with what was going on in, in, in Europe. And he spent a lot of time in, in France. He conducted throughout Europe and North America. Uh, and so was very exposed to developments in those countries. And uh, the final thing I think I'd want to say is we might want to juxtapose him with the people who really have the reputation for being the nationalists. That's the Magucha Kuchka, the mighty handful. So uh, Balakirev, Baradin, Musogsky, Kui, Rimsky, Korsakov, those people. Um, and Tchaikovsky was uh, at times uh, quite close to them, but generally rather skeptical. He thought they were a bit unruly, badly educated, um, spontaneous, brilliant and talented, but really not very disciplined. And he was quite the opposite. He was extraordinarily disciplined, hardworking, and he applied all of the lessons of Mozart, Beethoven, Schumann, and gave them a Russian inflection. So I think we have to be careful about what it means to talk about him as a Russian, because it's a Russianness that's always in dialogue and shaped by uh, parallels with what's going on in, in France and Germany. Um, and I think that was a predicament that many so-called nationalists faced at the time. Uh, Grieg in, in Norway, Sibelius in Finland, they're, they're always positioning themselves vis-a-vis -vis other traditions. And I think that's, that's what, for me, makes them, makes them very interesting. Absolutely. No, this sort of sense of working both in their own centre, but kind of per, sort of perceived as peripheral, but only when you're in Germany or Austria. Um, but actually, when you look at them from their own countries, they're the centre <laughs> and everyone else is looking out and suddenly the dynamics have to change quite significantly. So let's take a bit more of an international perspective then. So how does Tchaikovsky as a Russian composer become so popular in the UK because he really is a very, very popular figure um, in the UK still. Yes, and this happened actually in his lifetime. Um, after 1877, 1878, when he gives up teaching at the Moscow Conservatory, he embarks on a peripatetic career, spending large amounts of time in Western Europe, composing, thinking, shopping. He was a, 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 a quite a dandy who loved going around the Paris stores and buying shirts and ties and cravats. <laughs> um, and in these European trips, he often conducts his own works. And that was a really good calling card for a composer to be able to conduct your own repertoire, to turn up with the scores and play the fourth symphony, the fifth symphony, the sixth symphony, the, 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 the symphonic works, the 1812 overture, all of these things was a really good way to, to, to get your music known yourself. Uh, he visited England uh, 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 several times. He came first in 1888. And the most triumphant visit was in 1893, when he was awarded an honorary doctorate from Cambridge and performed Francesca da Rimini with the Cambridge University Orchestra. Um, it's a rather daunting work now for any orchestra, so imagine a student. Yeah, I was just thinking, gosh, then. what that sounded like. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I hate to think. Um, and he was well received in, in Britain. There was a kind of broader Russomania at this, at this period. Uh, Turgenev's novels, uh, Tolstoy's novels, Dostoevsky's novels were translated and read very enthusiastically. Um, and we can trace that back to the Crimean War. So after the defeat of Russia in, in 1855 by, by France and Britain, uh, both France and Britain actually embark on a, a very long period of trying to get to know their former enemy and also their imperial rival. Because remember, Russia is a, a very vast empire whose territories are impinging upon British India and the Far East. And, and Persia. And so Russia becomes an object of fascination and Tchaikovsky's music gets caught up in that. So he's visiting, he's conducting, there's a broader interest in Russian music. And I think we can't also uh, downplay the role of individuals here. So the conductor of the proms, Henry Wood, was married to a Russian, Olga. And it's a bit reductive to say it was just because of that, but Wood loved Russian music and programmed a lot of it in Queen's Hall at the proms concerts. And so already from 1897, we see a lot of Tchaikovsky. He's the most popular Russian composer in the repertoire. Uh, Rachmaninoff would later perform there and become popular. 
And in the first season, the Pathétique Symphony is performed three times alone. And the Pathétique features multiple times in every season for the next decades, along with lots of other works by Tchaikovsky. There was a Russian night every week in the proms in those early years. Uh, and so it's really a mania and his music is pretty ubiquitous. And whilst lots of people love this, and it's very popular with paying audiences, Quite a lot of British composers get very grumpy because they're really keen to see their work at the proms. And instead, here's this sort of upstart beardy Russian with his hot headed music, uh, who's sort of swaying the heads of impressionable audiences with all of this rather exotic newfangled music from the East. Yeah, that's the story of British composers throughout the 20th century, just being slightly annoyed that somebody else's music is being played more often than that. <laughs> Oh dear. But so, so let's come to the people who then haven't been celebrating Tchaikovsky quite as enthusiastically, because you mentioned before about his sexuality, um, and this has been a somewhat contentious issue. So how has his sexuality shaped Tchaikovsky's reception? Yes, well, I think the important thing to say in his own lifetime, it was acknowledged in his own social circles. It was an open secret amongst the Russian artistic intelligentsia, the cultural world, and indeed the imperial family. Uh, one of the remarkable things about um, 19th century Russia is quite how many uh, of the grand dukes of the Romanov dynasty were themselves gay, either exclusively or through bisexuality or through being married and having a, a private life, uh, which was a homosexual one. And Tchaikovsky is certainly part of this the gay demi-monde of 19th century Russia. Uh, his schoolmate, Alexei Apuchtin, a rather fine but uh, minor poet, uh, was actually a, a rather uh, flamboyant out gay man in, in 19th century Petersburg. And, Tchaikovsky's not that, he's much more cautious, much more coy about his private life, um, but it was, it was well known and it didn't pose any problem uh, for his public reputation uh, in, in, in large measure. And as his music gains popularity in the West, that is not known. Uh, his music appears uh, as Russian music, uh, as Tchaikovsky's music. But after his death in 1893, rumors do begin to, to circulate. Uh, about, about his private life. And they begin to appear in print, in coded form. People start talking about its, uh, its effeminate qualities or its uh, deviancy or its perversion or its melancholy. There's a whole sort of medicalized language of sexuality which begins to uh, surround the critical reception of his music. Uh, and I think we can't underestimate the impact of the Oscar Wilde trials in 1895 in, in Britain. Uh, and so when Wilde goes on trial um, and his personal life is revealed in all its gory detail on the pages of the British press, um, Tchaikovsky gets sort of, his reputation gets caught up in that. And people begin to rethink his music. It becomes, becomes very, very freighted with a, a rather critical set of discourses about its perverseness, its decadence, its neurosis. And that persists throughout the 20th century. Um, it reaches its uh, high point or low point, depending on your taste, in 1970, when Ken Russell makes his completely extraordinary film, The Music Makers, uh, which is one of those pieces of uh, art that are so bad they're good, uh, which, which is, I think, more to do with British fascination with sex lives of composers and artists than anything to do with Tchaikovsky. Uh, so I think we have to separate out Ken Russell from Tchaikovsky here. Uh, and throughout the 20th century, there was a lot of negative thinking about Tchaikovsky. So we've got this paradoxical situation in which his music has always been popular. It's never had a, a, a critical down, a, a popular downturn with audiences. It's always been in the repertoire. But in critical terms, it was not liked. It was not written about. It was seen as overblown, over romantic, uh, neurotic, uh, hyperly, hyper individualistic, uh, um, um, linked to his sexuality. And it was really only in the late 80s, the 1990s, when we began to rethink a lot of those premises. And there was some brilliant foundational work done by American and emigre Russian scholars who taught us to, to hear things in another way. And it's an ongoing process. It's still rather difficult in contemporary Russia to, to raise the importance of talking about Tchaikovsky's sexuality, uh, not in a prurient way, not in a reductive way, but it, just in an open and honest way and to, and to acknowledge the, the, the fact of his, his biography. And we could perhaps just go back in time to think about the Pathétique Symphony and why his private life became so actualized. He performs his wonderful last symphony, the, the Sixth Symphony, the Pathétique in Petersburg in October, 1893. 
and he dies nine days later of cholera. And the symphony is retrospectively seen as a, as a prophecy of his own death, his own mortality, and then becomes reinterpreted as a suicide note. There are various spurious claims about the, uh, what led to his death, uh, none of which really stack up very much. Um, and so his, his works get reinterpreted in this way, and I, I find that enormously unhelpful. I mean, it's, it's great for myth-making and biographers, but it's really not very helpful critically. But fortunately, the public have good ears and sensible minds, and they know to re read the right books and to, and to cut through all of the, the mystery-making and the mythography. Um, and thinking uh, you know, more broadly about this, I, I think it's interesting to think about Tchaikovsky's reception in the context of late 19th century Europe and Nordic culture. This is the world of Ibsen and uh, female emancipation. It's the world of Strindberg and these extraordinary dramas about uh, the sexual drive of people, of the, of the psychological underworld of bourgeois society. Even someone like dear old Sibelius, you know, sort of bald, craggy, uh, Finnish, masculine modernity is, I, I think, and you know, you, you know this much, much better than I do, part of this uh, fin de siècle of fascination with, with intimacy, sexuality, eroticism, and, and privacy. So I think there's a really Absolutely. interesting- Absolutely. <laughs> Yeah, and something I think Sibelius is so embroiled within that world, and he's also so heavily influenced by Tchaikovsky. I mean, the first time I heard Sibelius's first symphony, I thought it was a Tchaikovsky piece I didn't know. I was sat there going like, I've never heard this Tchaikovsky before, what on earth's going on here? And then it was Sibelius. Um, but so much sort of wrapped up with all these sort of fantasy actor ideas about sexuality. And those are the pieces that don't necessarily get associated with Sibelius so much anymore. You know, his songs, some of them are incredibly erotic. His 1913 pantomime, Scaramouche, mm -hmm. that's very, very rarely performed anymore, but it's, it's about sex. It's considered in its, you know, when it's performed in its own time, incredibly erotic it has all these kind of connotations of decadence exactly the same as you're talking about with Tchaikovsky um and then yeah the symphonies tend to have a somewhat different reception um but I think with both of these composers they have these fascinating lives and as you say it does sometimes get mapped onto the music and you know, you've written a biography of Tchaikovsky so you know these sort of pitfalls as much as anyone but how useful do you find it to talk about biography when we talk about music? Gosh, I mean, how long have we got? Um, right. <laughs> Sorry, that's that's the easy question. No, that's a softball one there. I think um, actually one of the nicest reviews of, of my book when it came out uh, talked about the undertow of scepticism that I had about life writing and biography when it came to Tchaikovsky. And, and I was really pleased that because I loved writing the book, uh, but I also, I, I struggled. I, I began my academic career as quite a formalist. I wanted to set aside biography, social context. I was interested in poetics, in form. Uh, and I, there's a still strong part of me which is absolutely fascinated uh, by the nuts and bolts of how works of art function as little machines and objects. And I think in writing the life, I was keen to foreground that aspect of Tchaikovsky, just the sheer inventive brilliance of, of the works on a technical level and the legacy that they left for Mahler, for Sibelius, for Elgar, for, for Stravinsky, for Britain, for a whole host of 20th century. But you're right, I couldn't get round the life and I, I enjoyed <laughs> digging into the life and getting to know a little bit of the personality. And I think I felt a great importance of telling the story truthfully, accurately, in a non-sensational way and, and not feeling that I wanted to overdo it, but also not feeling that I should be shy about talking about the complexity of his personal life. Um, we have to admit that this is a, a composer who married very rashly and unwisely in order to silence some of the brewing public discussion of his personal life, uh, who left his wife very quickly, uh, abandoned her, nonetheless paid her substantial alimony for the rest of, rest of his life, um, and who lived out his private life um, like many uh, well-born, aristocratic, wealthy gay men in the 19th century, um, through the sex trade by visiting um, uh, uh, sex workers in Paris, in Vienna, in, and, and one needs to be upfront about that and, and, and to talk about the past. Also, because talking about the past is also about talking about the present, and this is a subject that is still controversial in some circles and in some countries, and I think it's important to, to, to lay that down. But to go back to your question, the importance of biography for understanding the music itself, then I think I, I remain in many ways a bit of a skeptic. And here is where we really need Tchaikovsky in the room to have an argument with me, because he really did actually feel that 
music was about the outpouring of emotion, that music was about character, it was about personality. It was strongly linked to, to what he felt, what he had experienced. Uh, so we, I might differ from the subject of my biography in, in my own take here, um, but I think we do have to be cautious just because of the complexity of the compositional process. It's one thing to have an idea. It's another thing to work it out, to sit down and then orchestrate it and then correct the proofs and then to see it into performance. I think there's a very long gestation over these works and they may often have a biographical impetus, but the actual process when the creative mind takes over and the technical skill, Tchaikovsky's extraordinary technical facility that he had learned as a student at the Petersburg Conservatoire, honed as a professor at the Moscow Conservatoire where he taught generations of students the same things that he'd learned and that he learned by listening to other works. That for me is the really fascinating question of how biography is turned by some extraordinary alchemy of creativity into something which has its own life and leaves its imprint on the imagination of its listeners uh, and its later interpreters. So I, I'm, I'm cautious and skeptical, but I, I think that's never a bad thing for a scholar to aim to be, I hope. Uh, well, and also there's, when you say sort of, you know, these comp compositions are outpourings of emotion, there's a big difference between talking about emotional connection and m emotional conveyance in a piece compared to this is a piece about what happened last Thursday. This is the emotion I was feeling at the time and really very directly connecting life events. So, you know, somebody's child has just died, therefore they were terribly sad because composition can be a number of things that doesn't necessarily have to be a sort of directly correlated thing. Absolutely. Uh, I, I, absolutely, I, I couldn't agree more. And uh, a, a concrete example would be an opera like uh, Yevgeny Onegin, which mm -hmm. he writes in 1877, 78. It's set against the backdrop of his disastrous marriage. And he reads the story biographically. So in, in outline, the, the novel on which the opera is based, the novels by Alexander Pushkin, uh, involves a young heroine who uh, uh, meets Onegin and pours out her love for him in an unguarded letter. And he spurns her advances and regrets it for the rest of his life. And it's easy to see that as a biographical, in, in a biographical key, because at this moment, Tchaikovsky received a letter from Antonina Milukova, a young student, um, and he didn't want to behave like the fictional Lenyagin did. So rather than turning her down and saying, we can't marry and uh, don't send uh, outpourings of emotion to men you've never met before, um, he decided to marry her. Uh, so we can read it biographically, but for me, the most brilliant part of Onegin are the bits where Tchaikovsky imagines something that isn't him. So there's a whole plot in which Tatiana goes off and marries Grimin, um, who's a fat general who has no life in Pushkin's novel other than just to be a plot device. And what happens in the opera? Grimin is invented as a character. He has the most beautiful aria in which he sings of the redeeming potential of love in the life of an individual. Grimin in the opera is an older man, a battle-worn general who's, who is suddenly rejuvenated by meeting this beautiful young woman, uh, a society hostess, a great charming individual and a great moral force in his life. And Tchaikovsky pours into this music emotions that he himself probably never felt but that doesn't mean the emotions aren't real. Um, and that for me is as much you know, the alchemy of music to make us feel things that we ourselves have never felt. And there are spaces where artists can go to imagine things that they themselves have never lived through. And I suppose that that's for me, the real interest in the biography is to use it as a key to understand certain things, but then to go to those spaces in a composer or writer's output, which are wholly imaginative, wholly invented, wholly speculative, and this strange way in which sometimes works of art feel so much more real than real life itself. And I think probably Tchaikovsky and I might have found some common ground in that view. So for you, which are the Tchaikovsky pieces that, that really grip you? What are, what's your sort of re listening list for Tchaikovsky's work? Gosh, um, well, of course, what a responsibility. I can shape the whole listening <laughs> test, tests of, of, of our viewers out there. Um, well, I adore Onegin. I go back to it time and time again. And sometimes I worry, and, and you must perhaps feel the same when you're working on a work, a uh, piece of music that you love. Will working on it, writing about it, analyzing, destroy some of the magic? Will it take some of the charm away? And in fact, the number of times I've gone away and written about it or um, thought about it, 
I've constantly found new things, uh, delighting, delight, delightful things or quirks or corners that I'd never seen before. Um, and I think that's a gorgeous entry point into the, the sincerity of Tchaikovsky's world, the intimacy and the emotional truth that's there. Um, but probably I should use this opportunity to try and get people away from the, the, the Hall of Fame and what they're likely to uh, listen to and to know and to advocate for the things they don't know. So uh, for me, a revelation last year was um, being asked to do a proms talk about the Second Symphony, the, the Little Russian, uh, which is a magical work, uh, which I knew too little, even having written the book, um, a work which is the very opposite of emotionally intense, pathological, neurotic, uh, emotionally lacerating Tchaikovsky. It's uh, formally ambitious, it's dance-like um, and radiant and sunlit. Um, uh, it's a kind of neoclassical work long before neoclassicism sort of hit the, hit the musical world. So I think that will be a work that I'd really advocate, advocate for. I think the string quartets uh, are masterpieces. Uh, if you think of Russian string quartets, you probably think of the 20th century and Shostakovich. Um, so I'd, I'd suggest the three, three string quartets, extraordinary creative insights into his inner world in the 1870s. The, the thing I probably would say most of all though is other songs. And again, you know, with Sibelius, we don't know those songs enough. They are, they're gorgeous. Um, I began my work on Tchaikovsky by writing about his songs because I came into him by talk, thinking about poetry and the poets that he set. So I, there are more than a hundred. There are some very famous, None But The Lonely Heart is a repertoire piece and always has been, but there are a hundred more that people could dip into. And if people might see that as an inspiration to learn some Russian and to read not just Tolstoy and Dostoevsky and Turgenev, but some Pushkin and some Lermontov and some Alexei Tolstoy and some of the 19th century poets, Afanasi Fiet, then, then I will be more than amply rewarded and Tchaikovsky would too. So yeah, that would be my top tip. All right. Well, I mean, I think that's a sort of perfect point to segue to questions, actually, because I think we can sort of end on our listening recommendations and maybe some of our viewers will have uh, listen to some of those pieces themselves who knows I would add to that one I was thinking when you were uh talking about the sort of neoclassical in uh influences the string serenade the C major oh I love that piece so incredibly much <laughs> such a good piece um and really yeah yes I mean we, we think of Sibelius and Tchaikovsky as these Russian composers these Finnish composers these northern voices uh, full of long summer days and short dark miserable winters but in fact, they both loved Italy. They both loved the South. Tchaikovsky's favorite opera was Carmen. And mm -hmm. Sibelius composed the second symphony in, in, in Italy. And I think, I think the southernness, the light, the joy of both composers. So I just in the today. room now, so we, we, better, we better let him in. <laughs> Sorry, yeah, hey, we got uh, right. I'm here, I'm here, I'm here. I don't want to interrupt, but um, uh, there are actually a lot of terrific questions emerging here, some of which as we've discovered over the last four weeks, actually you've already answered as you go along. There's this sort of symbiotic thing in the ether that um, tells people what you, either what you're going to say or tells you what they're going to say and so on. I wanted to start with a very practical one, which is, have we got the date right? Apparently, April the 25th is another um, uh -huh. candidate for Tchaikovsky's birthday. Very good. Um, this is all to do with a glitch in the calendar. So until 1917, Russia used the Julian calendar, which was in the 19th century, 12 days behind the, the Gregorian uh, calendar. And in the, in the 20, uh, 20th century, 13 days. So we have to celebrate all Russian events in two ways. And we call them new style and old style. Uh, and Russians knew how to double date all their letters. But it causes a real headache when, when doing Russian history and Russian events. And uh, I have to say, I had a qualm when I realized I was up for this thing. Am I right about the birthday? But you know, like the Queen, he gets two. Very good. Okay. Um, we've had quite early on a little uh, good luck and many thanks from the Tchaikovsky Society in Germany. <laughs> um, and I thought that might lead us to think, because uh, part of a good deal of what you were talking about was Tchaikovsky's reputation abroad. Um, and I wondered about Germany in particular, whether there's a story to tell there which either intersects with sort of Leah's uh, understanding of Tchaikovsky being taken up by other composers over the course of the, the late 19th, 20th century, or, and or, you know, up to you to decide which one to go with, the notion of decadent music. In other words, was Tchaikovsky one of the decadent uh, composers at the point of National Socialist 
kind of description of that? Or, I mean, up to you to wh which of those would you like yeah. to think about Tchaikovsky in Germany as opposed to, let's say, in, in England? Yeah, it's a, a terrific question. And greetings to my, to my esteemed colleagues from the Tchaikovsky Gesellschaft um, um, and, and any others interested in this question. Um, Tchaikovsky spends a lot of time in Germany and in Austria conducting and traveling. He, he conducts in Berlin, in Leipzig, in Vienna, in Hamburg. Um, he has a rather testy relationship with some German composers. He meets Brahms, but there's not much love lost between them. And he admires Brahms' technique, but he thinks he's a little bit soulless and, and lacking in human warmth. Um, uh, attitudes are mixed. So the premiere of the Violin Concerto in, in Vienna is infamous. I think that's a work of Southern Italian charm with this gorgeous second movement full of Russian folk song intonations. And it's balanced and proportionate. Yet Hanslick, who was the leading critic in Vienna, said, this is music that stinks. Um, and we can see there the emergence of this, this discourse of decadence um, that was already sort of beginning to gain some traction in, in, in the cities. And it's a paradox. He is, he is a, a Russian composer who's trained in the German style by Rubinstein, who appreciates form and structure, and who's interested in Beethoven, who reveres Mozart above all, and yet whose music is often heard prejudicially as archetypally Russian and primitively Russian by unreflective, unattentive German, German critics. And there's just one more kind of interesting anecdote is that when he goes to Hamburg and performs there, uh, he has a really interesting encounter with a German critic who says, you need to come and spend some time in Germany and then you'll really learn to be a really good composer. Um, and what does he do? He writes the Fifth Symphony and the Fifth Symphony is the most pr well proportioned balanced, structured, well-behaved of all of the symphonies. It's full of nods to, um, to, to Beethoven, there are full of echoes I hear of Brahms's music, and he dedicated it to this German critic uh, and, and commentator as a sort of, well, I can out-German you, uh, but I can leave it full of the Russian soul, if you like. And one uh, last gloss is that uh, there are some extraordinary performances by Furtwängler uh, in, in the 30s um, of Tchaikovsky's music, banging this period of National Socialism. And they are extraordinary, lacerating, intense uh, things. So there's a really un interesting question to unpack that I'm not the person to do about Tchaikovsky under National Socialism. Um, mm -hmm. um, so uh, yeah, I, love, I look forward to finding my interlocutor for that question. Um, okay. But Leah, yeah, there's a sort of similar story with Sibelius in a way, isn't there? About I was going to ask, yeah. Long in those centers, but then always being seen as an outsider, always being seen as somehow national or foreign or from elsewhere. Yeah, and you know, at the start of Sibelius's career, you know, he was a Finnish nationalist and he was very much involved with the Finnish nationalist movement. Um, but that's really in the sort of late 19th, very early 20th century. And then by the sort of first, you know, from 1910 onwards, he's really starting to be a bit frustrated by this nationalist label. Um, and he sort of expresses himself quite a bit of frustration that it, he feels that it's kind of holding him back and he wants to be seen as this international composer. Um, he's also a composer who has a very checkered history in the Third Reich. He's incredibly popular. Hitler awards him a medal, which he doesn't go and doesn't go and get, but nonetheless, I think has an incredibly powerful impact on how he's received throughout the rest of the 20th century. Um, the music critic Theodore Adorno writes this really vitriolic piece of writing um, about Sibelius and how he's just an incredibly sort of damaging composer. And this comes out of the context that he's being sort of very celebrated um, in the Third Reich. So that I think definitely impacts on the way that Sibelius is sort of thought about and what happens to his sort of popularity, certainly mm -hmm. in critical terms in the UK mm -hmm. um, after the Second World War. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, Going back to sort of the Russian question one last time, um, one of the listeners asks, what do you think Sibelius, uh, sorry, Tchaikovsky, um, would have made of the current situation? Now, I don't know whether that questioner means lockdown or whether they mean <laughs> contemporary Russia. Um, again, perhaps one of you could take lockdown and the other one could take contemporary Russia. How, what would, yeah, in a sense, there's quite a few, what would, what would Tchaikovsky <laughs> do now questions? And the first one would be, how would he respond to, to, to the current situation? Gosh, who knows? It's a really, really tricky one. Um, uh, certainly Tchaikovsky's music is a is a quite a problematic topic in, in contemporary Russia. Mm -hmm. For those who don't know, um, several years ago, the Russian parliament passed legislation uh, 
outlawing um, the propaganda of non-traditional family relations, um, at, widely referred to as the anti-gay law. Yep. Um, and that means that it's impossible to talk about uh, homosexuality in, a, in an open, informed and scholarly way. Um, technically in contexts which are minors, so under 18s, but it's put a real lid on the whole public discussion um, and adds to this a discourse which sees homosexuality as kind of Western import, a kind of disease of uh, um, capitalist uh, societies out there whilst Russia defends traditions of marriage, religion um, and, and sort of old fashioned norms. You can imagine that your country's most celebrated uh, musical icon becomes a really, really difficult question. Mm -hmm. There have been various attempts to make a film about his life that, that have uh, stalled because of the inability uh, to come up with a public discourse of talking about this. So heaven knows what he would what he would say now. On the other hand, I think we should think seriously about how he negotiated his relationship with the imperial family in the 19th century. Tchaikovsky was not a political liberal. He was a bit of a political naive um, and a bit of an idealist and, and not very worldly when it came to politics, but he hobnobbed with uh, members of the imperial family. He happily took an imperial pension. He took commissions from the imperial opera houses. Um, he was not on the side of the political radicals who were lobbying um, in the late 19th century for reform. And whilst he became a beneficiary of the autocracy and the imperial system, we have to remember that the second half of the 19th century was one which witnessed the assassination of Alexander II in 1881. The year after Tchaikovsky's death, it would witness the assassination of Alexander III. The age of political radicalism was there and he was, he was not on that side of things. So, it's a really interesting counterfactual because this was a man who negotiated a tricky personal life with a, a repressive autocratic, uh, autocratic political regime. So, you know, make mm -hmm. of that if you will. Mm -hmm. That's lockdown, uh, then Leia. Leia then, do you want yeah, to take the counterfactual you. lockdown? What would he have oh, done in well, lockdown? I don't, know, I don't know about Tchaikovsky, but Sibelius would have been having a whiskey. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, he'd be, he'd be having a stiff drink. Very good. Um, I did want to come in and say uh, one of the things that's prepared me for lockdown is having read a lot of 19th century Russian literature, all of which takes place on country estates. My <laughs> city, the only way to get anywhere is on a carriage which gets stuck in the ruts. Um, and so, you know, scholars of Russian literature are quite used to existential boredom and long amounts of time trapped in, 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 in at home. And, and so I think Chekhov is an extremely good preparation for, mm. uh, for, for waiting for something to happen. Perhaps one more question about the contemporary context uh, of Tchaikovsky's life and uh, before we then move on to a range of questions about now and the future. Um, you've talked, both of you, about the question of his sexuality and the degree to which actually what might seem surprised to some people that perhaps there was a de greater degree of uh, being out and being open um, in that particular moment in the 19th century than there is today. And in other words, we don't just have a progression, we're all getting free air story because that doesn't work as it were. Um, but um, I wondered about the, or a number of questions have wondered about the status of women in the Tchaikovsky story, um, mm -hmm. because one can focus on his relations with men, but there were also important women in his life. Um, and indeed, um, yeah, could you talk a bit about the women in Tchaikovsky's life um, uh, and maybe also the degree to which they might have had a, a um, uh, some role, some power in his creative life, not just his, his personal life. Yeah, gosh, terrific question. Um, uh, we've completely failed to mention in our discussion the pivotal figure of uh, Nadezhda von Meck, mm -hmm. the great woman in Tchaikovsky's life. Um, so as we've already mentioned, he, he makes this rash decision to marry um, and leaves his wife very quickly and is faced with this real predicament of what to do because he's no longer earning an income as a professor at the Moscow Conservatory. He's an independent artist. He's struggling to pay the financial cost. And into his wife, into his wife, sorry, into his life walks uh, 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 Nadezhda von Meck, except she doesn't because they never meet. Um, she offers to give him a, an annual income, which will free him of the obligation to teach. Uh, she underwrites many of his expenses. She pays for concerts in Paris of his works. She is his patron and sponsor almost until the end of his life. And their relationship is played out in a very rich set of long, intense and very emotionally open letters that they share uh, over their long relationship. And they, they bump into each other a couple of times by accident and scuttle off embarrassed. 
And the intimacy of the letters is conditioned by the lack of a personal relationship. Mm -hmm. Fascinating relationship in, on his side because it allows him intimacy that I don't think he actually has with any other person in his life. Um, he's very fluent as a writer, he's good with words and the freedom of long letters I think is something he enjoys that I don't think he ever enjoys with any other person in his mm -hmm. life, much that he could be good company, a relaxed individual. And she too, I think, liked the intimacy uh, with a creative artist. Um, and she could construct an idealized image of him through letters, just as he could present the version of himself that he wanted her to see. So mm -hmm. fantastical relationship um, and a very central one emotionally to them, to them both. And it's an interesting form of patronage because very often patrons want their patronage to be made public. It's a mm -hmm. way of, uh, uh, of uh, perhaps converting financial capital into social status and social capital. But this is a, a private patronage that a very few number of people know about. And mm -hmm. it's one of the um, uh, documents that gives us most detail about Tchaikovsky's working practices, his aesthetic views, his political views. He is entirely silent about the details of his private life. Um, With her. Probably Najesha von Meck right. where, but um, uh, he never talks intimately about about that, and that works very well for them for them both. Okay, thank you. Uh, again, it's always interesting to discover in history what, if you like, what roles women could find themselves in relation to uh, artistic practice. And clearly, a muse is one, a patron is another. And I'm wondering whether uh, Leah with Sibelius, there's a, a, a set of untold stories there as well, or is is the story. I mean, I'm asking from ignorance here, um, is the story of Sibelius's relationship to muses, patrons, other women uh, in his artistic practice already known and clear? Um, so I, the, the big uh, figure in Sibelius's life is his wife, Aino. And I mean, without her, we, we wouldn't have a Sibelius, honestly. She keeps him from himself <laughs> he would have gone off the rails so many times i think had mm -hmm. it not been for her um and it's her who sort of like keeps curbing his alcoholism she puts up with an awful lot uh honestly but between the two of them um they obviously she sibelius cared about her immensely they had a very loving relationship um and certainly sort of for the time um you know she a, a, a very companionable a companionable yeah, can't say that word today. Mm -hmm. Companionable one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know what I mean. Yep. Um, and I think, but what's particularly interesting, so women very often tend to get written out of the story because they are sometimes working in the background um, as patrons. So Von Met, for example, I mean, she, mm -hmm. as you say, he, she gives him this, uh, Tchaikovsky this salary, which is so important for Tchaikovsky to actually to be able to write. Yep. Um, and then I think we shouldn't, also forget that particularly as we come into the 20th century, there are awful lot of women in creative roles themselves. Yep. So, you know, thinking of any number of British composers yep. um, in the early 20th century, we've got Rebecca Clark, mm -hmm. Dorothy Howell, Doreen Carwith, and you can sort of list them uh, endlessly. So women really have a really broad spectrum of roles in the kind of creative life of the early 20th yep. century. And leaping back in there to reinforce that, if we write our history of music entirely through composers, we are going to struggle until a certain moment in history to find many women in that story. If we rethink music as a form of social practice and think about its audiences and its actors and its singers, we get a much more inclusive history. And in Tchaikovsky's case, the plot for Onyegin was suggested to him by a singer, uh, Lavrovskaya, who said, why don't you read this novel and make a great opera? And he worked very closely with singers on all of the roles in his operas, and his operas are all centered around strong, mm -hmm. uh, imaginative, powerful women. And they're not just fictional creations, they are the result of his relationships with the leading divas in the Russian theaters. And here I should give full credit to my graduate student, Maggie Frenier, who's writing on Ch Russian operas in particular about this. So that's, that's not my insight. Again, in terms of the sort of biography or the life of, of something, uh, one of the recent forms of biography have been the biography of a book, let's say, or the biography of a particular piece of music or a particular opera, precisely in order to enable us to not just think about the men involved or the or the sort of authorial creator, but the, the many ways in which um, a piece of work, a piece of art comes into being and is sustained. Um, and I'd like to think for the last 
10 minutes or so to, to, to think um, about um, maybe one last question about the, or the original context, which has to do with this collaboration question. Um, we've talked about Tchaikovsky in relation to his private life. Um, one uh, question I asked, was he ever embroiled in what you might call an artistic feud? Um, if you like, separable from the private life with other composers, artists, writers, um, and so on. Was he a sort of, yeah, did he make his his way through arguing in the way that we know some people do? Ah, uh, great question, actually. Um, not, not very much. Um, he was, for a good part of his early career, also a music critic, which he did largely to earn money because he earned a pittance as a, as a young faculty member at the Moscow Conservatory. And he was also a total spendthrift um, and profligate. So he, he needed income. And those are very interesting about musical life in, in Moscow in the 1860s and 1870s and tell us much about his views. Um, we know that privately he has some quite sharp views about the nationalist composers, as I've mentioned. And in his correspondence with von Meck, um, he, he, he expressed some, some really quite tart views about them. But in correspondence with them, he tended to be much more supportive. And in fact, he often went into print to support his, well, not enemies, but people who he disagreed with when they were in uh, trouble. He, he's a great one for using his cultural capital to, uh, as a form of patronage, to use the weight of his name to defend the arts and Russian music at a time of their emergence. They are still on quite fragile footing. Mm -hmm. I think a great diplomat and politician who understands that sort of doing your dirty linen in public may make for good copy, but it's not really going to get you the institutional support you need from the Imperial Exchequer. So I can't think of that. He's too much of a tactful uh, uh, society figure and a good operator actually behind the scenes. So, right. But maybe I'm overlooking something. Um, I've got a, a kind of, I want to go back to the birthday question for a moment. And just because it's a very nice question has come in, which is um, how would Tchaikovsky have celebrated his own birthday? Would it have been cake? Would it have been some of Sibelius's whiskey? Um, what what mm. would he have wanted uh, for his own birthday? What might we offer him as a present? Ah, oh, great question. I the, the celebrations I know about tend to be from when he's on the summer estates. Uh, his sister, Sasha, um, had married uh, Liev Davidov uh, and they lived on their estate at Kamienka a large amount of the time. And he loves spending time there with his nieces and nephews, particularly his young nephew, Vladimir Bob, who uh, then plays a very important role in the Pathétique Symphony much later on. He loved playing whist. He, his diaries give brilliant accounts of, of um, gin rummy and drinking tea and hanging out on the country estate, playing the piano. So I think that's probably what he would have wanted to do, would spend it with, he, he, he loved his extended family and his siblings. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think I don't think he would have welcomed a society party and champagne and speeches. He was really very mm -hmm. worried about all of that. So my, my hint is cake and tea and a samovar on the side. Okay, and Leah, I don't want to overdo Sibelius's gloominess, but would he have would he have celebrated his birthday? And if so, how? Depends. If it's early in his life, absolutely. But as he f hits his fifties, he's like birthdays don't exist. I'm not getting older anymore. No, 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 no. So he, he, I think he is very flattered by a lot of the sort of big attention that he increasingly gets throughout his life. But probably he just wanted a quiet birthday by the end of it all. I suspect. Okay. There's also a number of questions coming in clearly from musicians, um, uh, and we should spend a little time thinking about the music itself. Um, perhaps from a compositional point of view, one person asks, could you say something about his compositional technique, um, Tchaikovsky, and in particular, perhaps the use of woodwind um, uh, and what, what makes him interesting from that point of view? Uh, that's open to either of you. Uh, well, I'll, I'll probably pass over to Leah at some point, who's a, a bona fide uh, musicologist. Um, yep. uh, I, really interesting questions. And I think the 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 view has changed. So for a long time, Tchaikovsky was deemed as someone who was trying to write in these Western European forms and give them a kind of Russian inflection, but failing. Um, so there's a very important 20th century music historian, Karl Dahlhaus, who, who very much treats Sibelius' uh, Tchaikovsky's orchestral uh, uh, practices in this way. Too much repetition, um, too much a tendency to take a theme and repeat it, vary it a little bit, and then move up a tone and padding. Tchaikovsky was also very aware of padding. He writes in a correspondence with a colleague about his tendency to what he called remplissage. And um, I think for a long time, musicologists were wedded to a kind of very Beethovenian uh, vision of what was good musical form, mu motivic development. And 
uh, it, that was sort of enhanced by all that sort of Schoenberg and 20th century stuff. I think we're now much more responsive to other ways of making musical form uh, about repetition, about block, about structure. Um, we've learned to hear, I, I think Stravinsky is really crucial in this point and, and thinking of Stravinsky as having learned from, 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 from Tchaikovsky in this regard. So I now think we hear the kind of heterogeneous sounds of Tchaikovsky in a much more positive light. Um, I also love his intrusion of incongruous material into the symphonic form. Um, I, I, I love that. Um, that's what Mahler does. When you listen to Mahler, it's full of folk tunes, Lendler dances, waltzes, um, brass band music, all colliding and shaking up in, a, in an unblended form. And Tchaikovsky always did that. So he was really good at taking us from waltzes to the fate motifs to, to sylvan moods. And I think he was the progenitor of that, that very sort of undigested is the wrong word, but it's a very deliberate juxtaposition of incongruity, which I hear as a sort of harbinger of modernity. Woodwinds, absolutely. I'm a, an ex-oboist, so I, I'm really glad of that, that question. He was an expert orchestrator and he would always have uh, interesting correspondence with conductors. And they'd say, you can't write like that. It's too high. You can't play pianissimo above the stave on the cor anglais at this point. And then a week later, they'd say, you're right. The player got it right and it really worked. So he often knew his orchestra better because he studied Berlioz, he studied Schubert, he studied Wagner, he studied the schools of composers and I think translated much of what he saw and heard into that. So great question. Mm -hmm. Leah, you're the, you're the real expert. Oh, uh, I don't know about that. <laughs> but no, I was just thinking when you were talking about the way that uh, Tchaikovsky kind of interjects with this material in the symphonic structure, and it made me think how important, pro how important programmaticism is to Tchaikovsky, right? He writes these gorgeous programmatic pieces. He's a ballet composer. And one of the sort of techniques that you have to have as a theatrical composer is being able to change direction, change mood incredibly quickly. And he's so good at bringing that into his symphonies or his otherwise unprogrammatic works. Okay, I'm the ignoramus here. What's programmatic music? Oh. So pro programmatic music is music that has a... Um, an, an idea that is associated with it. It doesn't okay. even necessarily have to be a particular uh, poem or sort of storyline, but it has an associated idea. The, the okay. idea of what programmaticism is changes over time, um, but I th it has a particular idea, usually a title associated. Okay, I'm interested in that phrase because again, one of the questioners says that we've used in this discussion the notion of the alchemy of music. Um, and it seems to me you might put programmatic over here and alchemy over there as opposites, but you're mm -hmm. suggesting that maybe they needn't be, that, that the, the alchemy can happen through the programmatic. Uh, uh, is that right? We're both yeah. nodding at this one. Yeah. Yeah, go on then. Go so for it. I think a program is never a reductive key to a work. Um, there are some works which have a sort of program to them. So the, the Romeo and Juliet fantasy overture, you're, you're kind of invited to hear the warring of the Montagues and the Capulets. You're invited to hear Friar Lawrence praying. Um, uh, Francesco da Rimini, we were invited to hear the writhing souls in hell, but it doesn't get you very far as a musical listener. And uh, so the program is a kind of key into the room, but what you do and how you move around it, how the performer interprets it is, is really crucial. And then there are hidden programs. We know that there, there were programmatic inspirations to the fourth, the fifth and the sixth symphonies, but we can't uh, deduce them retrospectively. And even if we could, it doesn't stop you hearing in a, in a new way. So the alchemy is the compositional one, but it's also our interpretive alchemy that we, we can bring to the live performance motive. So, Leah. Well, no, so I was just going to say, it definitely doesn't even have to be prescribed by a composer, this programmaticism, right? Because right. there is a very long history of hearing narratively. Um, so particularly Beethoven's Fifth Symphony, for example, has been heard in terms of kind of like a battle between uh, different forces, sort of ideas about fate. Um, and that's very much a kind of a programmatic reading, reading a narrative, reading a poem, reading meaning really into a work of music. And I think that's so important to why we care about music at all. It makes us feel things. It makes us want to be sort of wrapped up in the story of a composition. Thank you. Um, we're, we're nearly running out of time, but I just want two more quick questions about kind of the now, if, if you like. Mm -hmm. um, so Sasha on Twitter from New York, I think, says um, it's sort of a now, but it's a recent now. Why was Tchaikovsky's music looked down on in the 20th century? Um, there was that moment when it was sort of, uh, why was that? And do you think, um, that, does that snobbery remain or um, do we not need to worry about that snobbery anymore? Um, that might be more of a question for 
Leah, insofar as you work on 20th century stuff, but we can start with Philip and then move to Leah perhaps. I think it was his excessive popularity uh, with audiences. I mean, it, it was suspect in the eyes of serious critics. And there's that whole discourse in the 20th century of, you know, I'll write my music and I don't care if you listen to it or not. And that, that goes back to the concerts that Schoenberg organized in Vienna, and which were deliberately scandalous and provocative and plenty of other people have said that. And he gets a sort of associated with a middle brow, mass culture, um, Hollywood soundtracks, uh, Rachman, the same fate, uh, absolutely brief encounter is the worst thing that happens to Rachmaninoff's music. Um, and I think we've learned to be less worried by that. And I think musicologists have learned to be happier with kind of dirty listening, which allows us to hear for narrative and program and to hear um, both imaginatively and, you know, your phrase, the music itself, you get wrapped over the knuckles by a first year music tutor because you're never allowed to say that in music. Yep. Yeah, yeah. And, and I, I think it is that question of the middle brow, but I'm really up for context, um, extra contextual listening, dirty listening, imaginative listening and, and running with that as an absolutely respectable academic practice. I mean, yeah, I, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't really be writing if I didn't enjoy dirty listening. <laughs> <laughs> I like that as a phrase. I might, I might call a paper dirty listening. Um, but so I think, yeah, absolutely. There is this sort of discussions around sort of modern music and this idea of, you know, um, it being sort of important to write very difficult music that's hard to listen to. Um, and kind of coming back to what I was saying about Sibelius and the way he's received in the Third Reich, I don't think we should underestimate the importance of the Second World War and kind of popular music as it's seen and the sort of appropriations of particular composers in post-war narratives about modern music, because mm -hmm. it almost becomes a moral imperative to write difficult music that can't be appropriated for mass use. Yeah. And so composers who are very popular, like Tchaikovsky, sort of catch the brunt of that. Mm -hmm. um, I think we've moved on in those sort of ways of thinking. I think Philip's absolutely right. Um, personally, I, I do love to write about composers whose music is very popular. Um, so personally, I think, I think I'm, I'm not too bothered about the snobbery now, but I love to analyze the snobbery. <laughs> Okay, last question then, um, which follows very nicely from what you've just been saying, Leah, which is, it's the last of our counterfactuals. If Tchaikovsky were around for his birthday now, um, which contemporary composer do you think he would be most happy listening to? Who, which contemporary composer writing now would Tchaikovsky enjoy the music of? Do you want me to go first, Philip, or you? Yeah. Well, Philip, Leap in, if you've got a good answer. Yeah. Dabrinka Tabakova because her instrumentation is luscious. It is just absolutely sumptuous. If you don't know her concerto for cello and orchestra, drop everything you are doing <laughs> and listen to this piece of music. The second movement breaks my heart. And there is, I think, something I hear a little Tchaikovsky kind of influences in it. So I, I would 100% go for Dobrinka Tabakova. Thank you. Philip, do you want to add to that or should we? Uh, riffing off our earlier conversations as well and thinking of a composer from the European North who was fascinating by sonority and spectralness and love and its emotions uh, and a great opera composer but symphonic stylist. It has to be Kaya Sariaho. So, you know, that brings us back to Finland where everything begins. Thank you. Um, I, yeah, I think we should wrap up now because we've hit our sort of uh, two minutes past six mark. Um, but uh, I'd like to thank our two brilliant speakers, Philip and Leah, for a wonderful session this evening. Um, and a big thank you too to all the viewers at home for watching and for your comments and questions on YouTube, on Twitter and so on. Um, so one more time, thank you, Philip. Thank you, Leah. Thank you. Thank you. Everyone else, please join us for next week's Big Tent live event, this time on Wednesday. So change your diaries, uh, change the clock, not by the, the Gregorian or uh, Julian calendar, but to a Wednesday. Wednesday 13th of May at 5 p.m., where we'll be in discussion with the author Marza Mengiste. Um, Marza, as part of our Women's Week theme next week, will be in conversation discussing her extraordinary book, The Shadow King, which is an exploration of female power and what it means to be a woman at war. We hope you'll be able to join us again then. You have all given your time, your thoughts, your questions and your engagement as we come together online again. This series would also not be possible without the support, as it were, backstage from so many people, including the Torch team. But once again, thank you everyone for joining us and goodbye for now. <laughs>